Sean Ricker, better known to modern day wrestling fans as LA Knight, yeah! is currently one of the top guys at main event talents in WWE. And whether we're calling him Max Dupree, Eli Drake, or something in between, there's a reason the machine failed to get him booed, and that's because he is the definite article for what we as fans love in modern wrestling. That said, today I want to recount and establish with you why this is the case, and how his career took him all the way here. If you go on to enjoy the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. All that said, take a seat, grab a snack, and let me talk to ya. Yeah. Starting off in the world of professional wrestling could be an arduous task, I would know. But some guys just get into with all that passion at an early age and just take off running. Knight began watching from his childhood home at the age of just 3 years old back in 1985. Growing up watching the golden era of wrestling with the likes of Hulk Hogan, The Ultimate Warrior, and Macho Man Randy Savage populating his screen. And through this, he was introduced to a world that was undeniably larger than life because of these characters, and as such, he was said to become larger than life himself. Knight, while well, today he is 41, started in the wrestling business at the age of 20 in the year 2003, back when the Game Boy Advance was new and Lord of the Rings was winning award after award. A young and bold Sean had yet to find his voice in wrestling and had to, of course, train originally in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he learned under a wrestler by the name of Cody Hawk, not to be confused with Tony Hawk. Knight would debut in Heartland Wrestling Association and would find success early in his career by winning the HWA Television Championship at the age of just 21. Even early on, his peers noted how good Knight was and how he carried himself and how he took to the art form known as professional wrestling like a duck to water. He grinded the indies for a few years before getting his first bite at the big time in WWE in 2006, where he and a young John Moxley aka Dean Ambrose wrestled the big show in a handicap match as local talent. Additionally, he did make some appearances on ECW in 2008 where he teamed with Gene Snitsky against Crime Time. These were just one-off appearances, but this was him paying his dues to the industry and doing everything and anything he could to get noticed and be picked up by a major promotion. And his time in a major promotion would come in some form when the NWA came knocking in 2009, wanting him to work at their National Wrestling Alliance from Hollywood promotion, where Knight, going by his real-life name Sean Ricker at the time, would get in and work a reasonably successful tag with Brian Cage, known as the Natural Selection. The pair went on to win the NWA Heritage Tag Team Championships and held the title for over 200 days. However, the reign ended after Cage failed to show up to their match and Sean had to work a 2 on 1 handicap match. This led to the pair feuding for a short while where Ricker ended up getting the better of it by winning out their final match. Later on and moving into 2012 though, Sean would get in and make good friends with the likes of Percy Pringle, better known to most wrestling fans as Paul Bearer. This pairing added a lot of legitimacy to the already rising star in Sean Ricker who was already headed towards a date with the main event as he challenged the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion at the time, Adam Pearce. The pair battled for the title on Christmas Eve of 2012 where Ricker would lose the exchange, but this marked the first time he challenged for a major title which only served to raise his stocks. However, while Sean at this point was riding the highest of highs he ever had in his career, he unfortunately would be met with some of the lowest of lows here soon. As mentioned previously, Sean and Percy grew a special relationship on and off screen during Sean's time in the NWA. However, on May 5th, 2013, William Moody, known to WWE fans as Paul Bearer, passed away following a heart attack. On that same day, however, Sean would compete in a 30-man red carpet rumble match to decide a new CWFH Heritage Champion, which Sean ended up winning. However, a subsequent rematch between him and Scorpio Sky led to him losing the championship following that bout instantly, which was received extremely poorly by the crowd, and as such, the match was never actually aired. Following that match, he would announce his departure from NWA Hollywood to the live crowd in attendance and additionally would receive a standing ovation from his colleagues in the back for his time and work in the promotion. After leaving the NWA, the positive words Moody spoke about him as well as Sean's excellent work led him to the bright lights of WWE finally, where he went on to become a multi-time world champion is what I wish I could say. Sadly though, Sean was slated with the name Slate Randall and was put on NXT television where his only notable win was against Yoshitatsu in 2013 during a dark match. Following this one win, he would work in NXT until August 1st, 2014 as an enhancement talent to get other guys over. Oh, and those other guys are really notable fan favorites nowadays, like Mojo Rawley, Baron Corbin, and Mason Ryan. You know, those soon-to-be industry-defining modern-day superstars. Kidding aside, Sean really got the short end of the stick here as he was released on August 4th by WWE, seemingly because he sent out an email that someone in management didn't like. 
as well as there were some tweets that he sent out that weren't received so well by those in power at the time. As such, he was dropped like a bad habit and went back to the indies where Sean continued to hone his craft and better himself as a performer. Eventually, however, he would find his way to TNA, aka Impact Wrestling, where he would wrestle under the name Eli Drake, and would also form a stable called The Rising with Drew Galloway, aka Drew McIntyre, who wrestles for WWE nowadays, and Micah, who works for New Japan. The group worked as a trios unit primarily for about four months before being dissolved after Eli Drake turned on Drew Galloway. It was a reasonably fine feud for him and gave him a chance to square up against a bona fide superstar, but it didn't exactly light the world on fire. The first thing that really let Drake shine was his participation in the Feast or Fired match, which was a TNA stipulation at the time. The idea behind the match is based on the object on a pole match, which sees wrestlers trying to gain possession of items hanging from poles attached to the ring posts. In this case, the participants in the match try to grab one of four briefcases hanging from the poles. A wrestler can only claim a briefcase if he or she leaves the ring with it and both feet touch the floor. And each of the four briefcases contained a shot at a specific title or a little slip that said, You're fired! However, the one Eli Drake walked away with contained a shot at the TNA King of the Mountain Championship, which was a title with a rather unique history and lineage as well specifically having been called the TNA Legends Champion as well as the TNA Global Championship. This isn't especially relevant, but I figured it was worth mentioning. He would go on to cash in and win the title on May 31st, 2016, and subsequently went on one of his most iconic runs, where he introduced the Fact of Life segments where his iconic and most hilarious clips surfaced. Dummy! Yeah! Yeah! Dummy! Yeah! Yeah! Dummy. Yeah. Yeah. In just a few short months, he would lose that title to James Storm, but by this point, Drake had cemented himself as a mainstay for Impact, with him working several notable programs for other titles, all while doing his Fact of Life segments, which were a huge hit with the audience. However, headed into August of 2017, Drake would win a 20-man gauntlet battle royal. Yes, you heard that right, 20 whole men running down for their turn in line and winning. And the prize at the end of the day that Eli Drake walked away with was the vacant GFW Global Championship, which would be his first ever time holding a world title for a major promotion. Additionally, in an effort to put him over as hard as possible, he won that aforementioned gauntlet match from the number two spot, aka he started the match. He would hold that title for 146 days as he dropped the title to a returning Austin Aries, who is definitely a likable and great wrestler, I swear. And regardless of him losing the top title, what was more important was the impact. Get it? Impact? Anyway, what was more important is the impact that it would have on his career. He was no longer a guy who looked the part and could play the part. He was the proven and genuine article, and his solid run with the gold here only served to showcase that he is that guy. At least in the eyes of the fans. Despite Drake showing how damn good he really is, he kind of struggled to find himself as the top guy in Impact again, with the only gold he would hold since his world title run being in April of the following year, where he would find himself teaming with Scott Steiner to beat the then Impact World Tag Team Champions LAX for the gold. Which was a reasonable run, but yet again I would say it was nothing that set the world on fire. And the last major title match he would find himself in would be against Champion Moose, following yet another Fact of Life segment where he rated Moose as the number one dummy on Impact. However, the match left Drake without a win, and from there he fell down the card faster than Jinder Mahal did after he dropped the WWE title in 2017. Okay, maybe not that fast, but still. As you see, following some issues with how he was booked and how vocal he addressed those issues, Impact would release Drake in April of 2019. Drake would sort of struggle to find his footing again in the NWA after coming out as Nick Aldis' tag team partner during the Ring of Honor show Best in the World, where he announced that he had signed an exclusive deal with the NWA. From there, he wrestled at an event called Hard Times where he faced the Rock and Roll Express and the Wild Cards alongside his tag team partner James Storm, where Knight and Storm would win the match and the NWA Tag Team Championships. However, shortly following this, the pandemic hit and all signs of wrestling life would more or less cease. Well, unless you watch the deafening silence of the Thunderdome era. And as the pandemic went on, Drake was let go from his NWA contract, citing budget cuts as the reason. With this, he once again fielded offers from a myriad of different wrestling companies before landing in WWE once again. This time debuting under his modern day moniker of L.A. Knight. Showing up at NXT TakeOver Vengeance Day, he debuted as a heel and instantly adopted his now beloved moniker. He had a few matches on TV before participating in a North American Gauntlet Eliminator, which he lost. 
but it was a good showing of what Knight was capable of, as well as a sign of things to come for him. As far as giving him something really proper to do, they paired Knight up with Ted DiBiase at TakeOver In Your House, where he defeated Cameron Grimes in a ladder match to become the Million Dollar Champion. Which is a pretty big deal considering Ted DiBiase is one of the most prolific heels in the history of wrestling. This then led to a fun little feud between Grimes and Knight, where Knight would eventually turn on DiBiase. Knight, being as good as he is, went over Grimes multiple times, and Grimes had to serve as his personal butler in some awesome little segments. However, as all good heels do, he eventually did lose their final match, where Grimes captured the million dollar title from him. It was an awesome little story for them both, and both Grimes and Knight came out the other side looking better than ever following it. Following this, however, on September 14th, my birthday, Knight would have two matches. One being a loss to the debuting Braun Breaker, and the other being a loss in a fatal four away for the vacant NXT Championship. They did this to me on my birthday? Following that truly traumatic day for me, Knight would begin a feud with Grayson Waller, where the two would do a double turn, having Knight adopt more of a fighting spirit and becoming a babyface. This as well as further debuts of several NXT 2.0 stars led Knight and several black and gold NXT stars like Johnny Gargano, Tommaso Ciampa, and Pete Dunne to fight in war games against the Rainbow Puke 2.0 era stars and Waller, Breaker, Carmelo Hayes, and Tony D'Angelo. The black and gold lost to the new generation coming up and Knight went on to have a few more notable matches here in NXT, such as his NXT title match with Dolph Ziggler, which was a total banger by the way. He unfortunately lost that match, and following it, he had a short feud with Gunther, who at the time was going under the name Walter, which would subsequently be his last match in NXT, where he laid down for Walter before heading on over to the main roster. Now listen, we were always going to have to talk about Max Dupree. As the manager of Mansoir and Massey, he was seemingly slated with being nothing but a mouthpiece. But people left and right watching this guy on their screen knew that he was a world-class talent. And before long, he was given back his LA Knight persona and was off to the races under the early Triple H regime of WWE. His booking under this new start was a bit wishy-washy at first, with a solid feud between him and Ricochet showing what the 40-year-old could do. However, it wouldn't be long before Trips booked him against one of the modern day's biggest stars in Bray Wyatt. And listen, all the teehee funny blacklight neon trunks and funny uncles missing elbow drops aside, this was a means to let Knight dance with one of the top draws in the company, and showed that he could at minimum make the prospect of the match interesting, even if the actual match itself was a far cry from what both men were capable of. Now, leading into Mania in Los Angeles, it seemed like a surefire thing that LA Knight would have a match on the card. Los Angeles, LA, LA Knight. It just makes sense. And when he wasn't featured, many fans were upset and actively protested it on Twitter, which seemed to get the attention of some of the guys in management, as Knight did receive more TV time following Mania, although he was on the receiving end of many losses despite his constantly rising popularity. However, as fate would have it, Knight would be inserted into the men's 2023 Money in the Bank ladder match, where he was slated as a heavy favorite. Unfortunately for the megastar, he wouldn't secure the briefcase, but even if he didn't ascend to the top of the ladder, he did rise in the ranks of WWE. His first big win came in the Slim Jim Battle Royal, which was unironically a really large win in terms of his on-screen momentum, as from here we'd manage to pick up more and more wins. And the win also positioned Knight as a prime candidate for doing all of the Slim Jim ads for WWE in the future, and got him this fire whip. After months of performing as a tweener type character, he seemed to fully turn face during his feud with The Miz, who he traded some great verbal barbs with on the microphone before beating the A-lister on two separate occasions. The first happening at Payback with John Cena as the special guest referee, and the second two weeks later on SmackDown, which ended their feud. Following this, Knight would take a short hiatus from WWE before returning to aid John Cena in his fight against the Bloodlines Jimmy Uso and Solo Sokoa, which the pair defeated at Fastlane where Knight managed to pin Jimmy. It is however important to note for this match that originally it was going to be AJ Styles who fought by Cena's side, but after Styles got injured, Knight was able to step into the spotlight. Plus, with a win over the Bloodline, this would place him in the sights of Roman Reigns, who he would start a feud with over the undisputed WWE Championship. The pair would face off at WWE's Crown Jewel event, where after Bloodline shenanigans, Knight was pinned by the Tribal Chief. However, following his loss, Knight made it clear that he aims to make his way back to a rematch with Reigns by beating every single member of the Bloodline. And as such, he went through and kinda did that. Before, at SmackDown New Year's Revolution on January 5th, 2024, 
Knight faced Randy Orton and AJ Styles in a triple threat match to determine the number one contender to face Reigns for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship at the Royal Rumble. The number one contendership match ended in a no contest after the Bloodline took out all three competitors, and then SmackDown General Manager Nick Aldis then announced that Reigns would defend his title in a fatal four-way match against Knight, Styles, and Orton at the Royal Rumble instead, which Reigns won. Following his loss, Knight then began feuding with AJ Styles and qualified for the Men's Elimination Chamber match at the titular event, where he would ultimately be eliminated by Drew McIntyre after Styles interrupted the match and attacked him. This attack would eventually lead to Knight chasing down and challenging Styles to a WrestleMania match, which Styles accepted. And while some folks might feel like he should be going after the US title headed into WrestleMania 40, I'm pretty happy with the progress Knight has made in this past year. Right now it seems like the work I spoke about in this video is about to pay dividends for Knight, as his stock has risen higher than ever in the last few months due to his charismatic promo style, solid in-ring work, and arguably larger than life megastar persona. And even if he doesn't win a title until next year's Mania at the absolute latest, it'll be hard to continue ignoring his organic reactions from the crowd. Speaking of organic reactions, if you like this video at all, it would help me out immensely if you consider leaving the video a like, as well as let me know what your favorite moment of Knight's career is so far. For me personally, it's gotta be his win in the Percy Pringle Battle Royal, if only due to the sentiment of that moment. That said, frankly the guy is a career highlight reel, so I can only imagine that people have a lot to love. As always, I hope you stay safe, and that was delightful.